Welcome to this community newspaper program, Excellence in Education. This is Marta Perez, and our mission is to expose and inspire excellence in education. Follow us on Facebook and send questions via our chat room. Today, we have a very special guest on our show, and she is a treat, and that's meant to be a pun, because we are so honored to have one of the biggest names, the biggest celebrities in the gastronomic world, and I mean by world, the entire world, as our guest. Michelle Bernstein is more than a TV personality. She is the host of two shows, Check Please South Florida, and the Emmy award-winning production, So Flow Taste on Channel 10. Plus, she also has appeared and appears on national TV programs, including Top Chef, Chopped, Network, Good Morning America, and many others. She is the winner of an extremely prestigious award given only to the top chefs in the world, the best chef of South Florida in 2008, the James Beard Foundation Award. And she owns and operates Michelle Bernstein Catering. Uh, many know her also as the owner and top chef of great restaurants in Miami that are a lot of fun to go to and delicious food to eat, including La Trova in Little Havana, Sweet Liberty on Miami Beach, and lately La Cañita on Bayside. And if you haven't been to those restaurants, go because the food is out of this world. And if that were not enough, she is very interested in the topic of our show, Excellence in Education, and has brought Common Thread to South Florida, which is a program that teaches children about cooking and eating. She is a superstar, a supernova. She is a great mom and a family member. Besides, she is so beautiful physically, and all who know her attest to her inner beauty, which is even larger. Please welcome one of the top chefs in the world. We are so honored to have with us, Chef Michelle Bernstein. <laughs> Hi, Marta. Thanks. I'm giggling because it's, it's to your kindness, and uh, we're just delighted. And your beauty, of course. Tell us. talking? about you tell us about yourself and okay. your background so um i am zach's mom um <laughs> i am a florida native i was born and raised into miami shores and you uh, were born uh in in, in miami in miami yeah. and your parents well, actually i'm lying i was born in hollywood memorial hospital <laughs> if I tell you the truth. my mother was argentine uh she was four generations argentine my father was from minnesota and um, he, after college and after the war, decided that he had to meet the cousins that ran from Ukraine to, uh, to South America, to Uruguay, the Bedensteins. Uh -huh. And so he went to meet the Bedensteins in Punta del Este, which is in Uruguay, where everybody goes to the beach. And vacationing there happened to be Martha Cohen, my mother. And so they met, they fall in love. They go to Minnesota. It's too cold. So they came to sunny Miami where my sister was first born. And then I was born. You have one older sister. I have an older What's sister. the difference in age? She is four years oh, my senior. Me too. I have yeah? a sister four oh. years older. That's <laughs> the best. Yes. She's always taken care of me. Yes, yes. Yeah. And so they came, your parents came. Uh, neither one was from Florida. Nope. But they settled here for the weather because it was the too weather. cold for your mom. Yeah. And actually, it was too cold for dad. He for was dad. done with Minnesota. He oh. had been there for too long. And so, uh, yeah, they came here. They were very, you know, nicely greeted. You know, Was your first language Spanish? Well, mommy didn't speak English. And dad okay. did speak Spanish because he learned it in the University oh, of Minnesota. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> I don't know how good it was. <laughs> but he always spoke perfect Spanish with... Mm -hmm. uh, a very thick American, very cute accent, uh -huh. actually. <laughs> and so, you know, they had a lot of issues in different places, um, mainly because of prejudice. And um, there were a lot of problems. Even dad mm -hmm. told me when, when they were living in Minnesota and they were trying to find an apartment, they didn't want to rent to him because he was Jewish. So oh, my goodness. I think that here they found some solace, you know, and so they, they 
they settled here. And then we were, my sister and I were raised in Miami Shores and I went to Miami Shores Elementary, as did she. We loved, loved that school. I still remember the principal, Mrs. Loring, was one of the kindest people. Mrs. Ellis, one of my favorite teachers in the whole world that will live in my heart forever. So we had a great, you know, great growing up. We would walk to school. Um, and then later I Wait, graduated. Did, your from, mom was by herself here. I mean, in other words, did she have relatives here? Nobody. No, it was just your mom and it dad. Was mom it and was, dad. that was, a, there was the, 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 she had no family. help. Yeah. She yeah. had no help. Um, and it was always pretty much like that. Mm -hmm. And so the four of us very much stick, stuck together uh -huh. and mom didn't work until I was, you know, old enough to come home on my own because she always wanted to be there for uh -huh. us. And yeah. was she a great cook? <gasps> She's, Still to this day, I will never be a home cook like she was. And why? she was the best. How how did she? How did I don't she know what that? I don't. She learned it herself too, because in Argentina, you know, you don't learn to cook. You just you go to school. Cooks, there. Everybody has a cook. Even the cook has a cook. Yes. You know, it's not like a level yes, of yes. you know higher class. It's just how it is. But her family, what kinds of meals were they prepared? Because they were European. Well, they didn't prepare the meals. The cook prepared yes, the meals. Yes, yes. But, but then were that they, cook had a cook yes. that prepared the meals. But the meals were Italian, just like everybody else. In, Ar a in Argentina, a lot, in, of, a lot of a lot of Italian food. Milanesa. Yes. Uh -huh. You know, um, I'm sure there was a lot of bechamel. There were empanadas. There were on the weekends, uh -huh. you know, the grilled meats and things like that. But she didn't learn how to do it. So when she came to this country on her own, she taught herself how to cook. And uh -huh. it's interesting when I really think about it, it was very 70s, 80s food. You know, it, it, there's definitely a style to the 70s and 80s of food. What is that? Um, it It's like these little touches, like in every sandwich, there was always um, alfalfa sprouts pita bread started coming around. That's right. Uh, there was always chicken salad or tuna salad at the table. Um, and mom would make these elaborate dinners. I mean, there was arroz con pollo, but then there was always, you know, green bean almondine, and then there'd wow. be a huge salad, and then and there'd did, be a little something Were there sweet. cookbooks, or was it just from her mind? I think it was a little bit of both. She definitely didn't scour the internet because there wasn't one. And so, yeah. No, I think, in those days, no. it was cookbooks. <laughs> it, was, cookbooks. it was cookbooks, but also it was a lot of trial and error, I think. And I don't think she ever gave us the errors. I think she gave us whatever worked <laughs> out well. But the food was always, she just had a hand. I always asked her, mommy, your hand must taste good because <laughs> everything you make out of it is so good. And so I opened years later, I opened a bakery kind of in her honor. It was called Crumb and that was in the design district. And she would come and she would bake her pies oh, and her cakes. And she was older and she wasn't extremely healthy. We, she had cancer. And so we would start making them for her and it would all be mama's cakes and they would all be, <laughs> you know, paraded there. And yeah, everybody loved her cakes. And, and so when you were in high school, mm. what did you think you would, this was going to be your <sighs> life? No, I didn't know that this was even available. So no, I was a, I was a ballerina since I was three. Oh, I don't wonder. <laughs> yeah. And um, I had always danced and that really was going to be my future. And so they even set it up to where I took extra credit so that I could graduate at 16 so I could go to New York. Really? And dance. Oh, you were oh, very yeah. talented. Well, you're so beautiful. And, and, and uh, so, I'm Marta. So uh, uh, you move so Look gracefully. Speaking. Look, I, I think uh, thank you. Uh, it, it shows. Like, uh, <laughs> I think I lost that. it a few pounds ago. <laughs> no. but thank you for saying so. So, um, but I will tell you in high school in North Miami, I took home ec as we all did, uh -huh. right? Yeah, it was a requirement. It was requirement. And I failed the sewing part. Oh. And um, <laughs> But when it came to cooking, Mrs. Johnson was my teacher and she gave me some recipes to make and in her class. And I remember she allowed us also to write cookbooks of our own and come up with recipes of our own. And in, in, it really kind of lit something within me um, that I could, I could actually cook like mom, you know, I could possibly do something like this. Cause mom was, you know, she was in the she kitchen. She was the gold standard. She was the gold standard. And, and she didn't really like a lot of people in her kitchen. Oh. Like she loved when I was there. Cause I really helped and I wanted to help, but she wasn't one to say my, me, she, this is my recipe for, let's okay. just say my empanada filling. Okay. Right. And this is how you do it. And this is how I would, no. she never wrote okay. it down. Oh. Yeah, it was all from memory. And 
she just didn't have the time for me to write it down because we were constantly moving and feeding everyone. So, um, or did your parents like to entertain? Did was it? Oh my common goodness to gracious, my lot, really? I mean, there would be sometimes like 150 people at the house, and your mom made mommy all that? made it all. Oh, and, my and God. she would clean. Oh. I mean, it was just, she, I don't know how she did it all. She was amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. She was <laughs> so a beautiful woman. That was the, the, the seed. That planted the seed for sure. A seed I didn't know was there And then you, you, there you went to later. New York to dance? I did. I danced. Um, I was very young, but I danced and I struggled. And I, I got in with Alvin Ailey into their training season. Um, I was too young to join the company part of it or travel because I was still just turning 17. Um, I had met Brishnikov, who told me that I would probably fare really well in New York until the cattle calls. I've, I've always been a little bit shorter and, and very strong in my legs. And every time, you know, Balanchine types would see me, they'd say, you just don't have the body. You no. should you should go to Vegas. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> yeah. And which is something, you know, for a classically trained ballerina. And I had talent. I just don't think I had the length. The length. The length. Yeah. So um, Did it didn't work out. Did you ever consider going to Vegas? No. No. <laughs> it wasn't for me. It was no, not. No. no. I, was, I was a very shy girl. I was very into classical dance. Um, I did enjoy you know martha graham style and alvin ailey style and the african dance and i did it for a little while and then i just went home with my tail between my legs and i went to see mom and it's all i ever dreamt of since i was three and i said Aww. i think i have to start over and you how old were you by that i was 18. Aww. and and in other words you finished high school in new york no i graduated at 16. oh here. oh because how how did that happen I took classes ahead because uh, I, this so you is, wanted, you have to understand this was programado. Like this was in the program. This was what I was going to do. And I had to do everything I had to do ahead of time to be ready for it. Mm -hmm. This was my dream and I was going to make it happen. Yes. And then my dream changed. And then your dream changed. Yeah. And then how did this dream get oh, channeled? How did it manifest? Yeah. Yes. That part is kind of funny and, and a little, um, a little cloudy to be honest with you, because I never wanted to be a chef. I didn't think, I didn't even think that was in the realm of possibility uh -huh. because no one ever spoke of women chefs, nor no. did I know of any to even talk to. So the road was long. I, I started out studying biochemistry and nutrition in school. Where do, where in, in school? In Emory and in Georgia State University. And I really thought that that was the path I was going to take. I loved food. I didn't know how much. And I love science. So I thought nutrition, food chemistry, biochem, all of that came together for me. And I was very, my, my brain is kind of a little more science uh -huh. geared. Um, and so I did study. I graduated. I came back home. And I was supposed to go do an internship at a hospital to finish off my full degree in dietetics. And my mother <laughs> looked at me and she said, I know you. I know you're not going to go to the hospital. I know this is not going to Because I was not, that was not, I was not clinical enough. And she knew and I knew because I was like digging my feet. I didn't know what to do with myself. And she said, you know, you could teach. And I said, I don't think that's for me either. I don't think I'm very patient. I'm a, an instant gratification kind of a girl. Yeah. And she said, well, this is crazy. But there's this culinary school opening called Johnson and Wales. They're opening just a few blocks away. Why don't you walk in? Maybe one day you'll do a TV show talking about good food. Your Maybe mom? you'll write a book really? about healthy food. Who knows, Michi? You know a little bit about cooking from me. You know about the science of it. Who knows? Wow. I know. So me, I'm like 90 pounds. You know, I walk into culinary school and I see a couple of women and I see a lot of older men, men. that are there that obviously knew what they were doing because they were already carrying their knives. And I walked in, you know, totally ignorant, not knowing what the heck was going on. And I said, yeah, I, I don't know if I want to be a chef, but can I just study? Of course, you already have enough that you don't even have to take any of our, you know, uh, you regular classes. Uh -huh. Just take the cooking classes. We'll see where it takes you. All right. So I was the worst. Like I was the only one in all of Johnson & Wales at that year in 92, I think. Yeah, 90, either either 91 or 92. That, that part gets a little... Um, wacky in my head, but I was the only one who had never cooked before. 
because most of the people that were there, I realized later, were professionals that wanted to hone their skills uh -huh. or to just get a degree. Uh -huh. But not me. I was kind of searching for what I wanted. But I will tell what you. What was the first class you had to take? So it was stocks and sauces. Oh, stocks and sauces. How to make a, a chicken stock. <laughs> and I thought mine was better than the way that they were teaching it. And I was, uh, you know, I had taught, I, I learned my mother with ways. But at the same time, I didn't know how to hold a knife. I didn't know, you know, I wasn't strong the way these guys were physically and some of the other women. Um, they just, you know, they kind of grabbed hold of it all where I was a little shy and, you know, I knew flavoring, but wrestle, I didn't know anything else. Wrestle with a piece of meat. Wrestle right, because I have a cow. <laughs> and so, um, you know, I went to one of my professors and I said, I, I see that I'm not doing well. And he said, well, where have you worked? And I mentioned a couple of retail stores <laughs> and a couple of dancing. He says, no, 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 in, the, in the, my industry. And then I said, I never have. He said, that's the problem. Everybody else has for years. Go get a job. Oh, okay. So I was going to school from seven to three. I went and met, do you know who Stephen Reichlin is? No. Oh, you should. He's <laughs> fabulous and you should get him on the show. Uh, okay. Stephen Reichlin is an incredible writer, a food writer. Oh, He's okay. a chef, but also more importantly, a food writer and, and very awarded and very knowledgeable. And he needed an assistant oh. to test recipes, but also to clean the floor. <laughs> so luckily I joined him. But then also at night I found um, a restaurant that would take me in. It was in Coconut Grove. It was called Janjo's. And um, I don't know, do you remember Janjo? Uh, yeah, it sounds familiar. Yes. They took the old village in space. So um, I went to work there. So I had like two jobs in full time school. Wow. And I was working like crazy. And what I was advancing. And you loved it? Yes. Uh, yes. I loved that I was getting better. Oh. I didn't know if I loved what I was doing. I was bleeding a lot and I was burning myself a lot. I would come home and my mother would say, Michi, have you become a masochist? Are you doing this on purpose? Because <laughs> I'm a little torpe, uh, clumsy. Uh -huh. I'm a little bit clumsy. And so if there's a way to cut yourself, that's going to be me. Oh. So I've gotten better. Um, and the one thing that kept happening, though, is even if I was friendly with the people that were working in these restaurants or not, everybody would say, what are you doing here? <laughs> You're a nice Jewish girl. Get out of the kitchen. You'll never become a chef. You don't have what it takes. Oh, my goodness. But these were even my friends that were saying this. <laughs> chefs that I still know today that were saying, Michelle, trust me, this isn't for you. This industry is too hard, too physical. You're not made for this kind of work. Mm -hmm. Look at you. You're too delicate. You're too small. One chef pulled me aside and said, okay, we're going to start going to the gym. You're going to get stronger. You're going to show these guys what's up. You're going to show them that you could be just as strong as them. He didn't say it in front of anyone, of uh -huh. course. And that's what I did. And wow. so um, little by little, I would, you know, I would do a lot of, of strength training and I would show up to work and I would go there an hour earlier before anybody else would. And I would carry all the pots and pans to my area and I would do all the things I had to do to get ahead. And so everybody would think that I was moving faster than they were. And well, little... perseverance, that's wonderful. Well, th yeah. that's uh, amazing <laughs> that you have been able to do all that. What an inspiration to our students. What a great story. What do you enjoy the most in your industry? What, after having done all that, what do you love about your, what, your work? And I love a couple of things. First, I love serving people. I really... You mean serving people, helping people, or serving people, putting a plate before All of them? it. I love hospitality, and my husband and I are really good at hospitality and of just servicing your needs. When you walk in, I feel like I know what you're going to want. Uh -huh. I feel like you, I know what you're going to need. My husband is so great at the service side of that. And what, I'm, what do people want? What do people need in a restaurant? They just don't want to have to think about anything. Uh -huh. They want to come in and they want their questions to be answered honestly. They don't want to mess with explaining too much, you know, to anyone. They're there to enjoy. I mean, when you go to a restaurant, mm -hmm. you are there to just have a memory, uh -huh. right? A, a little piece of your life that becomes possibly a memory for your whole life. Yes. Who knows? Yes. And so we're there to change your frown into a smile. Uh -huh. We're there to really just take care of anything you'd ever want. And you trust us by taking your money and feeding you. We have to trust you as well and and share that trust and make sure that we give you everything you deserve for that trust. And what are the big challenges mm -hmm. then 
I often go to a restaurant and think, how do they have this big uh, menu? menu? Yeah. And maybe somebody doesn't order two or three of these and, and then they have, you just have to throw them out. So that's a really good question. I'll tell you how that works. And which is why I don't have big menus. When you go into a place that has like a book yeah. for a menu, if you really read between the lines, you'll see that almost every single item on that menu is done a little bit of a different way uh -huh. on the next page of the menu. Oh. So it's all using the same ingredients. It's just done in a different style. Or different sauces and so Correct. forth. Correct. Oh, different exactly. flavorings, different ways of doing it. So it, it's really interesting. And I've I've learned a lot about that because it's what I don't want to do. And <laughs> tell us about opening a restaurant. How was that? It's terrifying. Terrifying. Which you know, it doesn't first, matter how was big. was first business that you opened? So the first restaurant <laughs> Dave and I ever opened was Mishi's. Mishi's. Mm -hmm. Mishi's I, I, was on. I tell us about David. Oh, my, <laughs> my David. So David Martinez, uh, who I met at the Mandarin Oriental when I was the chef at Azul. Uh -huh. He was first a waiter and then a manager. And we fell in love and kindled our relationship uh -huh. there. And um, we left there and we actually were running a place in Cancun while we opened a place here. Oh, my goodness. And we started our, our voyage together uh -huh. and it was terrifying uh, for both of us. And it still is. We just opened a burger place, Little Liberty, uh, oh. a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah. Where is that? It's in the timeout market in Miami Beach. And I was just as nervous opening that little burger place in a timeout market uh -huh. in a food hall than I am about anything. You know, it's all scary. Um, it's not only obviously a financial thing, but Risk. it's also, <laughs> but it's also my name and our reputation. And, you know, I, I pay for good schools and good therapies and doctors for my son. And, <laughs> and we all have stuff that we need, need, not want, but need, and we have to succeed. We have to. I'm not getting any younger. So I know oh, yes, that you are. Eh. You're so beautiful. <laughs> oh, please. But you know, every time we do this, we, you know, we understand the, the severity and the seriousness of it. So yes, it's yeah. a lot of responsibility. It's a lot of responsibility. What would you, what, you know, we have students that uh, also have stars in their eyes about doing what, you know, being Michelle Bernstein. What would you tell a student who aspires to be in the hospitality business? I would say do what I didn't oh. study business, study business. Yeah. Study, if this is what you want to do, you will always be able to hone your skills in cooking and creating and all that. And obviously travel as much as you can to really refine your palate and learn about ingredients and how they should be used and how to respect them. Mm -hmm. But learn business. It's essential. And, and how important in your life has it been to know so many cultures? Uh, I think it's huge. And, and languages. I, well, it's, it's enormous. You know, if I didn't speak French... <laughs> I don't think I could have learned everything I absorbed in, in France. And that really formed the way that I cook, all the techniques what I you'd learned. Say, you'd say that your cooking is based on, on what? Very what much is on, the, on the... Southern French um, <laughs> cleanliness and simplicity and the importance of ingredients and technique. Technique is everything for me. Um, the natural Are the French, the, is that the most sophisticated food, if you would say? Not today. No? Not today. Who, I, what, don't get me wrong. They're the all way, wonderful, yes. What, no, but what I'm what I'm trying to say is the formative part of the French cuisine is the most important part. Today, what they're doing in places like um, Mexico City, I don't think there's anything like it in the world. Really? Um, Peru I, can't be matched. Um, Spain, although um, I would have said five years ago that Spain was number one, which it's still, don't get me wrong, you know, Good. ridiculous. The to top two restaurants in the world, you know, Italy and then Spain. But what they're doing in parts of this country and in Mexico City is is bewildering at this point. And how is that? What what do you mean by that? What is it? The sauces? Is it the in mixing of ingredients? It's just a sensibility and an intelligence and um, understanding how much an ingredient can do on a plate. Like you go to Mexico City and you go to some of the better restaurants and not only are they using, I don't know, throw me an ingredient. Um, Basil. Give me something Not else. that one. Give me, something <laughs> give me a vegetable. <laughs> throw me a vegetable. Uh, sweet potato. Okay. So not only would you see 
let's say the skin of a sweet potato being used, but also the inside fleshy part, but you'd also see a juice of a sweet potato being reduced. And then you would see maybe the leaves from the plant, from the sweet potato plant being used in another way. I mean, it is just amazing. Yeah. It's a total use of product and it's a very smart way to use it, but also delicious at the same time. What is your favorite meal? What, what if they said we're going Whatever to Whatever anybody cooks and puts in front of me for that day. Really? You don't have a favorite? My something? favorite meal is something anybody else is cooking for what, me. What, what about comfort food? Do you have com any favorite comfort Well, don't get me wrong. You know, roasting a chicken at home uh -huh. with my boys is my favorite thing in the whole world. Uh, and you have two, your, your, tell us about your boys. My boy, one is David Martinez. <laughs> okay, one. Okay, I thought, did I miss something? I thought it was one boy. Okay. And then the other one is Zachary, my okay. son. Yeah, my 10-year-old. And, and, and how do you relax? Uh... We go to the beach, we hang out, we swim a lot, we take a lot of walks. Um, we enjoy each other's company quite a bit. We are quite the three musketeers. And um, and I read incessantly. When I can't sleep, I read. When what I do have you read? <clears throat> anything. But do I you go read? from nonfiction to fiction, uh -huh. and I always have one of each in my phone at uh -huh. all times. Um when my head is going crazy and, and I feel like I need to create and I need to figure things out and I need to calm, I open up a book. Okay. That's great. Our students should hear that. Mary. <laughs> I Excellent. try to get my son to do the same, you yes. know, because his, he has a beautiful mind and um, he has a very high intelligence. And so that brain doesn't stop working. And so we try to read together quite a bit. That, that's wonderful. That he's a very lucky boy. I'm lucky. If I'm you lucky. had a magic wand or a magic bullet, uh, a bullet what would you change? Oh, <laughs> we're almost out of time. I'm asking you these uh, sort of rapid fire questions. Well, I hate to speak politically, but there's a whole lot I would change right now. Right now. Yeah. Yes. I, I really don't want young women um, to go through what my ancestors had to go through 50 years ago. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and why do you think, Michelle, that you are so successful at everything you do? Uh, I'm so sorry to tell you, Martha, you're incorrect. I, you no. seem to I, be so. I try hard in everything that I do. I put as much passion in the small things as the big. And, and I'm talking everything. Um, and that's, if you don't have passion, if you don't have drive, if you don't have the desire to want to do something great, then don't bother doing it. So we're just coming off of doing formula one and we fed thousands upon thousands. Oh, you were involved. Yes. <laughs> and I had the whole part of the yachts, oh, you know, that okay. whole three floor craziness. And I put so much attention into that, that I actually had to put everything else on hold of work mm -hmm. for the last four months, which we're gearing up to start ramping up everything again. But I believe in dedication. I and believe that's the only way to do what something makes right. you the happiest. When my family is healthy and happy, then I'm happy. Oh, thank you so much. Anything else you want uh, the public to know about this wonderful chef, that uh, this uh, superstar that we have, this very humble superstar that we have uh, in our community? Honestly, Martha, I think that what you're doing is probably the most essential part of it all. If we didn't have the education that we have, and it's we're important. so lucky for people like you oh, and thank you. <laughs> our superintendent and all of those teachers out there um, who are so wonderful. I mean, even my son's teachers bring me in to teach cooking ah, to good. my classes. But if we didn't have the, the, the educators that we have, I don't think we could be anywhere. So it all begins with you, with them, and with our school system. And then after that, it's up to you what you want to do with it. But have drive and have passion. Well, we heard. I've heard that you are opening up another restaurant. I think you're opening up three more. <laughs> but one is in Coral Gables, and where are the other two? So I'm opening up Senora Martinez, which is funny. I've never gone backwards and uh -huh. done something that I've already done. But it was so successful, and the only reason why it closed was because of um, a little problem with the building. Uh -huh. um, so we're opening Senora Martinez uh, in. Coral Gables, but we're also opening uh, Mishi's Chicken Shack in downtown Miami, oh. as well as a place called uh, a place called Loncheria in Julian Harry's uh, food hall in downtown. 
Oh Very my exciting. goodness. Very exciting. Yeah. And we are yeah. looking forward to having all those wonderful meals. I'll bring you food. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> because uh, if you haven't been to one of Michelle's restaurants, you must, because you can tell. And as she says, I mean, there's a difference between just throwing some food on and, and then all of those little nuances. Someone once said, the difference with fresh uh, French food is that there's it's very nuanced. And I think that's true about your recipes, that there it's complexity. the little details, the complexity, the yeah, details. Yeah. So if you want to treat, uh, please uh, go to La Trova, La Cañita. And now soon we're going to have three more restaurants. And what's Little Liberty? Little Liberty. And, and little Sweet Liberty. Liberty. And Sweet Liberty. Go for the best cocktails. The ever. best cocktails. Yeah. And both places. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for it's being our guest. Thank you all for uh, tuning in to our show, Excellence in Education. Thanks, Monica.